Hello, my name is Chrissy Champagne, and you are listening to Residue, a true crime podcast dedicated to keeping you paranoid. I have been obsessed with true crime since I first hid behind my aunt's couch as a child while the adults watched 10 to Midnight, starring Charles Bronson. Sorry, Mom. Begging my mother to buy me all the Anne rule books at the drugstore, making sure I was home when Donahue came on, satanic panic, y'all, and of course, the queen of instilling the golden rules into my life, Oprah. Number one, never go to the second location, and number two, always trust your gut. So, it is mind-blowing to me that being obsessed with the story of Amy Fisher at age 15 didn't clue me into what a red flag was, and more importantly, what a sociopath was. And okay, I know, 10 to midnight, it's not technically a true crime story, but it got me paranoid. It got me going. That girl, Mary Jo, is a class act. She was the love of my life. She was the love of my life. She was the love of my life. I turned my head, and it just, there was an explosion in the side of my head. And just like that, I was gone. I went up to her doorstep with a loaded gun in my pocket. I proceeded to talk to Mrs. Butterfuco. She turned around to walk away. I hit her on the back of the head. I went to hit her again, and the gun went off. Superficial charm, grandiose self-worth, need for stimulation, prone to boredom, pathological lying, conning and manipulative, lack of remorse, parasitic lifestyle, promiscuous sexual behavior, lack of realistic long-term goals, irresponsibility, impulsivity, failure to accept responsibility for actions. These are the traits of a sociopath. May 19th, 1992. The sun is shining in Massapequa, New York. The smell of freshly mowed lawns, birds chirping, spring is in full effect. It's that quiet calm that comes over you when you finally have the house to yourself. Your husband is at work. The children are in school. It's time to have a cup of coffee and finish up the household chores. Mary Jo Buttafugo was ready to finish a project in her backyard, painting her benches, when she heard the doorbell ring. A young girl stands before Mary Jo, who looks to be about 14 years old. The young girl says to her, Are you Mrs. Buttafugo? I'm here to tell you that your husband is having an affair with my little sister. Mary Jo, a self-proclaimed smartass, which I love, by the way, looks at the girl, who to her looks to be about 14 years old, and she says, little sister, how old are you? Amy says, I'm 19. That doesn't matter. I found this t-shirt today while I was making my little sister's bed. It's a t-shirt from your husband's auto body shop. Mary, being the self-proclaimed smartass that she is, looks at the girl and says, you make your little sister's bed? And I can't, I have to stop. That is my favorite thing from this whole story. I can't stop laughing about it. Mary Jo has had enough of this strange and awkward confrontation. So she turns to go back into her house as she says, why don't you have a nice day? And as she's turning, she remembers feeling an explosion, falling to the ground and not being able to move. Mary Jo has said in interviews that this whole story could have gone a completely different way if she had not turned her head at that exact moment. The very next thing that Mary Jo remembers is that she woke up, saw these bright lights shining in her face. She saw a nurse coming at her yelling, Mary Jo, Mary Jo, you've been shot. You're in the hospital you're going to be okay. A bullet lodged in her neck had barely missed her brain and spinal cord. She was now paralyzed on the right side of her face. The hospital staff and the police officers had handed Mary Jo a scribble pad. They wanted to see if she could write anything down that she remembered and what she wrote was 19-year-old girl, Anne Marie. She said she was having 
but then she faded out when she was finishing off that sentence. And this was huge for the police because at that moment they had never even suspected a woman had done this to Mary Jo. Mary Jo is also able to mention the t-shirt from Complete Auto Body Shop. And she has said that the minute she mentioned that t-shirt that Joey immediately speaks up in the hospital room and starts uh, defending himself. Like, I never gave a shirt to anybody. I only gave a shirt to one person. I only gave a shirt to Mr. Fisher's daughter. Who is Mr. Fisher's daughter? The police ask. Amy, says Joey. Amy Fisher. Amy Elizabeth Fisher was born on August 21st, 1974, in Merrick, New York, to Elliot and Roseanne Fisher. It was in 1990, at age 16, that Amy accompanied her father to an appointment to get his car fixed at Complete Auto Body. That was where she would meet the man that would change her life forever. Amy was an only child, and in school, it was said that she didn't get along with her classmates. She barely showed up to class. She was a chronic runaway. She was best known for dressing provocatively and bragging about her older lovers. Amy's parents had bought her a car, and her father brought the car into Joey's auto body shop and told him that if Amy ever needs anything done, if she ever gets into any accidents, and she brings the car in to just fix it, and he's going to take care of the bill. July 2nd, 1991, Amy brings her car into Joey's shop to have a sound system installed. And when you watch any of the made-for-TV movies about this story, there are three of them. Um, One of them has Drew Barrymore as Amy Fisher, and one of them has Alyssa Milano playing Amy Fisher. The scene is always depicted in every single one of these movies. It's the moment that these two had met and this whole affair was about to begin. But the installation was said to take about a few hours, so Amy asked Joey for a ride home. And Joey called Amy's father first and asked permission to drive his teenage daughter home. And then, of course, he says yes. So once they get to the home, Joey asks for a tour. Amy has stated that they went up to her bedroom and this is the first time that they had slept together in Amy's teenage bedroom. And that same night when Amy picked up her car, Joey asked her to meet him at the Freeport Motor Inn and Boat Tell. At only 16 years old, Amy would continue to have an affair and sleazy hotel meetups with Joey. Amy has stated that Joey became the father figure that she never had. She wanted to fulfill his every desire. And four months into their relationship, Amy tried to kill herself because Joey wouldn't leave his wife. A month later, they were back together. Amy and Joey clearly have two different stories as to what happened in this relationship. At first, Joey won't even admit that he was having sex with Amy. Amy goes on to say that it is at this point in the six-month relationship that Joey gives her a job as an escort, or he sort of pushes her and grooms her into being an escort. And in the made-for-TV movie Lethal Lolita, which is the only one of the three made-for-TV movies that Amy says in her own words in the beginning of this film, Amy is shown to be Um, showing up to strange men's offices, hotels. She goes on to say that Joey started whining and dining her, taking her to fancy restaurants and cheap motels. And she believed that he had her best interest at heart. Joey says that none of that is true. It's at this point in the affair relationship that Amy is starting to ask her young teenage male friends if they would help her carry out this hit on Mary Jo. Now, these young men are not really actually planning on helping Amy. They are into the idea of it because Amy's actually offering them money, but she's offering them blowjobs. So... (laughs) They're teenage boys, and Amy's pretty hot. So they go along with the idea just to 
basically get out of her what they want, which kind of seems like a running theme in Amy's life at this point. And one of the young men was named Stephen Sleeman. He was 21, but police actually said that he acted much younger than that. He was a waiter and he was friends with a guy named Chris Drellis. And now Amy had first asked Chris to pull off this hitman um, stunt on Mary Jo. Chris knew that his friend Stephen had a rifle, so he actually told Amy, why don't you talk to Stephen? And Stephen actually did end up going to Mary Jo's house with Amy on November 1st, 1991, and he hid in the bushes while Amy knocked on Mary Jo's door. And Amy showed up to the door carrying a box of chocolate candies and pretended like she was selling candies for her school. And of course, Mary Jo, who uh, the school was her alma mater, as she said, she was like, sure, let me get some candy. Um, Mary Jo is just so hilarious. I love her. She did state in her book, she was like, why is this chick selling me candy on the day after Halloween? Like, I don't have enough candy. But nice lady. She went ahead. She got a dollar out of her purse. She gave Amy the dollar and Amy left. And Mary Jo looked at the back of the candy bar and realized this candy bar is from the grocery store. It says it costs 15 cents. So 50 cents. So why is this girl at my house selling candy? But she kind of let that thought go. Steve, in an interview with 2020, has stated that he couldn't do it. He couldn't pull the trigger. He couldn't do this to this woman. Amy was, of course, pissed, furious. And it ended up that Steve was one of the men that ended up going to the police station after the news came out that Mary Jo was shot. And he told the police, yeah, this was a premeditated murder. Now this setback isn't going to stop Amy. So Amy gets the help of Peter Guagenti. I don't know if I said his name right, don't really fucking care. But Peter Guagenti is a Brooklyn auto supply salesman and he is now going to act as Amy's getaway driver. He also obtains the FIE Titan 25 caliber handgun that Amy's going to use to walk up to Mary Jo's steps, knock on her door, and shoot her in the head. And so now we're back to the beginning of our story. And we need to talk about who is Mary Jo. Well, first of all, Mary Jo is a fucking badass bitch. This woman not only got through this with humor and dignity. In Mary Jo's book, she does say that one of the hardest parts was the fact that when she was first hurt, the newspapers, they talked about it. But they just said, wounded woman recovering. Nothing about what actually happened. Wounded woman, going to be okay. Shot in the head, she's going to be fine. But then once they got a whiff of the fact that this was a Joey and Amy show, it just went nationwide. The media blew up. Mary Jo Connery was born May 15th, 1955. She met her husband, Joey Buttafuckel, in high school, and they got married shortly after. At the time of the shooting, Mary Jo and Joey had been together around 20 years. They have two children together, and I highly suggest watching the 2020 episode Growing Up Buttafuckel because her daughter, Jessie Buttafuckel, is hilarious. She's a character too, just like her mother. And that episode will give you a lot of insight into what it was like for the kids to grow up in this environment and have the media outside of their house constantly and have their parents become these insanely public figures. Which I lived through this point, I believe I was about 15 or 16 when this story became huge and just took over everyone's lives, but I was actually recently talking to my husband about this case as I researched it, and we were both discussing how this story would have played out in the year 2023. How would they have handled this situation, the media? How would they have told the story? Because I think it would be a lot different than it was back in the 90s. So the newspapers are calling Mary Jo wounded woman. Now let's just really get into what this wound pertained to. This woman was shot in the head and she survived. 
she still to this day, in 2023, has a bullet lodged in her head. She will forever have Amy Fisher and the day she was shot literally stuck in her brain. So what happens when she's in the hospital? Mary Jo's in the hospital and it is pure hell, stuff you can't even describe. She's not only finding out that it's possible that her husband was having an affair with basically a child, but she's just had her entire world turned upside down. She is told she's going to be deaf in one ear and continue to be deaf. I believe it was her left ear. And she states that it's not what you think when you're told you're going to be deaf in one ear forever. That throws off the balance of everything. I want to read to you a section of Mary Jo's book, and I'm going to read it word for word what she says. So while she's in the hospital, she needs to have her wound attended to every day. So the wound is the bullet stuck in her brain. She can't take this bullet out. The surgeons refuse to take it out because they think it's too risky. So they're like, you know what? The best route we're going to take is you're going to live with this bullet stuck in your brain. Mary Jo went on to write a book after all of this had ended for her. And the name of the book is brilliant. I'm going to tell you right now, this is the greatest name for any book ever, especially when a woman who got shot in the head wrote the book. The name of the book is Getting It Through My Thick Skull. Why I stayed, what I learned, and what millions of people involved with sociopaths need to know. It's it's fucking genius. Okay, so this is an excerpt from her book describing what it feels like when the nurses come in. My fresh wound needed to be frequently cleaned out and fresh bandaged. This was accomplished by a nurse who inserted an extra long wooden Q-tip directly into the bullet hole to swab out any debris and disinfect the area. Once cleaned, the area was packed with fresh cotton, which had to be poked in bit by bit, like stuffing a turkey. My head hurt constantly, horribly, all of the time already, and the searing pain I felt when that Q-tip entered and probed the wound was an indescribable level of torture. Three people had to hold me down for this procedure, otherwise I would have thrashed all the way off of the bed. This cleaning had to be done four times a day, and the process never became any easier to bear. I soon began to cry the moment a nurse walked into my room holding a Q-tip. Police quickly start to realize who the culprit was in the shooting of Mary Jo Buttefuoco. Joey has mentioned that he gave a shirt to Mr. Fisher's daughter, Amy Fisher. He provides a photograph of Amy, a Polaroid that he said was in one of the toolboxes of one of the guys at his office. Um, why did they have a Polaroid of Amy in a toolbox at their office? So police bring this photograph to Mary Jo, and she says, yeah, I mean, that could be her. Just looks like a plain girl with brown hair and brown eyes to Mary Jo. But police identify that Amy Fisher was, in fact, the girl that walked up to Mary Jo's doorstep and shot her in the head. So now we must find Amy Fisher. On September 23rd, 1992, Amy Fisher was arrested and charged with attempted murder. After accepting a plea bargain, she pleaded guilty to first-degree assault. As I've said before, the media goes absolutely crazy. Everyone goes wild. There is a tabloid television show called Hard Copy in September of 92, right after Amy is arrested, who broadcast a videotaped conversation between Amy Fisher and Paul Makeley. He was the owner of a gym in Massapequa, New York, who Amy was having an affair with. In the tape recorded hours before she agreed to the plea in court, Fisher could be seen talking about her future, saying that she wanted to marry Paul Makeley so that he could visit her in prison. And this gives you a little more insight into the type of person Amy Fisher was at this time. She says to Paul Makeley on the tape, that will keep my name in the press, meaning if they get married. I want my name in the press. Why? because I can make a lot of money. I figure if I'm going to go through all this pain and suffering, I'm getting a Ferrari. And you got to say that with a Long Island accent because it makes it sound so much better. 
On December 2nd, 1992, Amy Fisher was sentenced to 5 to 15 years in prison. She served seven years and was granted parole in May 1999 after Nassau County Court Judge Ira Wexner shortened her maximum sentence to 10 years, which made her immediately eligible for parole. But what about Joey? What happened to Joey Buttafuoco during this court case? Joey Buttafuoco denied ever having an affair with Amy Fisher. And then in October 1992, the Nassau County District Attorney stated that Buttafuoco would not be prosecuted. However, in February 1993, the case against him was reopened due to rape charges made by Amy Fisher. She testified against him in court and based on this testimony in hotel receipts dated before Fisher's 17th birthday, with Buttafuoco's signature on them, Joey Buttafuoco was charged with statutory rape. He pleaded guilty in October 1993 and he served four months in prison. Even through all of this, Mary Jo continued to stand by her man. She stood by Joey through this entire process. And then in 1998, when Amy was up for parole, Mary Jo did go to the parole hearing and was on the side of actually letting Amy out of prison. And she did say, and I quote, I will be in court when Amy Fisher goes for resentencing. And then all I want to do is forget that this whole thing happened. Of course, that is where the story could end, but it is not, and nobody did forget that this whole thing happened. It still became a media circus with Joey and Amy using every opportunity that they could take to make money off of what happened. Now, this whole story started in 1992, and I want to read a headline for you from an article in a newspaper um, from May 14th, 2007. So this is these two sociopaths still trying to make this happen still trying to make money off of this fisher and butterfuco the reunion special wow can it possibly be true the new york post reports that headline making ex-lovers joey butterfuco and amy fisher will be reunited for a romantic candlelight dinner this monday night as cameras roll producer david Kreef is reportedly going to try to make this temptuous reunion into a reality show why don't we change a couple things in there to say rapist Joey Buttafuoco groomed Amy Fisher? No, of course, we're going to go with temptuous relationship between the 16-year-old and the 39-year-old married man. It's going to become a new reality. It's so gross. Mary Jo even reunited with Amy Fisher on a televised entertainment tonight in its spinoff The Insider. Fisher said she wanted to heal and move on with her life. However, two years later, she said she felt no sympathy for Mary Jo. Amy Fisher went on to marry Louis Bellara, and the couple had three children before they actually ended up divorcing in 2015. But in October of 2007, Red Light District Video published a press release stating that it intended to release a sex tape of Amy Fisher and Louis Bellera. On October 31st, frames from the video showing Fisher naked were posted on websites. On November 1, 2007, a teaser clip was released by Red Light District Video showing Amy Fisher naked while she showered and sunbathed. On January 12, 2009, Amy Fisher released a pay-per-view adult film, Amy Fisher, Totally Nude and Exposed. She signed a deal with Lee Entertainment to become a stripper, doing club shows at least once a month. Fisher said she planned to strip until her fans told her, Dear, please, put your clothes back on. You're too old. In September 2010, Dream Zone Entertainment released the adult film Deep Inside Amy Fisher, calling it the first of eight such films Fisher would produce herself and in which she would star. The company had announced the movie in July 2010 under the working title The Making of Amy Fisher, Porn Star. As of 2022, Amy Fisher was a webcam model and still residing in Long Island, New York with her three children from her former marriage to Louis Bellera. On February 3rd, 2003, Mary Jo Buttafuoco filed for divorce from Joey Buttafuoco. 
2004, Joey Buttafuoco is sentenced to a year in jail and five years of probation after pleading guilty to auto insurance fraud. As a part of the sentence, he is prohibited from working in the auto bottle industry in California for the rest of his life. In August 2005, he was charged with illegal possession of ammunition. As a convicted felon, he is illegally not permitted to own ammunition. Probation officers found the ammunition during a search of his home. He pleaded no contest and began serving his sentence on January 8, 2007. He was released on April 28, 2007. Joey is now married to Eva Franchko, whom he wed in 2005. In November 2019, ABC News reported that he was working on a film about his early life. He told the outlet, I'm not that kind of guy that's just going to sit here and blame anything on anything and how I got here. Say that in a Long Island accent. Okay, enough about those two. Where is Mary Jo but if you go today? Mary Jo admits that she was angry for years and years. In interviews, she was always sarcastic and hilarious, and her humor was always shining through. She made a remark once about forgiving so that she can move on. She said, She can't have Amy in her head anymore. She's already tried to kill her once, and she can't let that happen again. It's interesting to see how Mary Jo's stance changed throughout the years, and that is so typical of someone who was under the control of a narcissistic sociopath. As I said, she has the greatest book title of all time, Getting It Through My Thick Skull, which I highly suggest you listen to or read. I say listen to because I actually listened to the book on Audible, and Mary Jo narrates the story, her own story, and she's got a fantastic delivery, and it's just, it was really cool to hear her tell that story. People always asked Mary Jo, why would you stay? Why did you stay with him for so long? And it's really hard to express to someone why you stay with a narcissist or a sociopath or a narcissistic sociopath. And it can take decades to realize that you're being brainwashed. And even after you realize, it's going to take decades to get over that, that trauma that it caused. It's almost like it's a rite of passage to be fucked over by a narcissist. When you watch old interviews of Mary Jo defending him, it feels really sad, but you can understand why she did it. It's like she was trying to convince herself that what he did was okay. Mary Jo would go on to meet Stu Tendler, who she married in Las Vegas in 2012. Sadly, Tendler died from cancer in 2018. In 2017, Mary Jo underwent surgery to repair her partially paralyzed face, some of the nerves that kept her from smiling. This was symbolic of her leaving this mess behind as best as she can. Finally, being able to smile again. Growing up, Mary Jo's mother used to say to her, when are you going to get it through your thick skull? And you know what? She finally did. She finally got it through her thick skull. She's got a bullet stuck in there to remind her that she's a fighter. She's not going to go out like that. And nobody should ever mess with Mary Jo. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of Residue. If you enjoyed this show or any of our other episodes, please leave Residue a five-star review. If you do leave a five-star review, just take a little screenshot of it. Send it to me in my DMs, either at Instagram, Residue Podcast, on Facebook as Residue, or an email, residuepodcast at gmail.com. I have stickers now, so I will be mailing out stickers and little thank you notes to anybody that sends me a five-star review. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you have a safe and happy holiday season and stay paranoid.